Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra. I'm professor of political science and also professor of Chicano studies. I'm also director of the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Tonight, you're going to witness the Urban Lecture Series. This is a lecture series that's been going on here at the university for over 10 years. We bring all kinds of community, uh, business, and nonprofit individuals to come and talk to us about issues facing our city. We hope you enjoy the show today and stay tuned for a great conversation about our great city. So first and foremost, right next to me is uh, Jeff Keitlinger. He is General Manager and CEO of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. As General Manager, he is responsible for directing the activities of the district to fulfill <laughs> Metropolitan's mission to deliver high quality water to 19 million residents in Southern California. In his honor, we did not bring bottled water, we brought uh, uh, public water. Uh, the general manager reports directly to the board of directors and provides that that means that the that means that the uh, uh, board sorry about that they really I wanted to make sure that you knew it was brand new that nobody that nobody else had used it okay. um, fortunately we're going to do the re intro again so that won't be caught on film or anything so uh, the general manager reports directly to the board of directors. What that really means is that they could fire him at any time, and they also hired him. And he provides leadership and management of the district's public policies and strategy initiatives, assets and resources, and all administrative, operational, and financial activities for Metropolitan. Prior to his appointment in 2006 as general manager, he was general counsel for the district. That means he was his head lawyer. Uh, Mr. Keitlinger was responsible for directing Metropolitan's legal staff and consulting attorneys and leading the district's legal strategies in pending and potential litigation and protecting Metropolitan's in interest in all legal matters. Uh, Mr. Keitlinger earned his bachelor degrees in history from UC Berkeley and a law degree from Santa Clara University and it's that Jesuit connection that led us to really invite him more than his position. So good Jesuit training. Uh, next to him is Raul Amesqua. He is partner and head of investment banking for De La Rosa and Company. Uh, prior to joining uh, De La Rosa in 2003, he uh, worked for 12 years with other New York-based bond firms. What were those firms? You don't want to mention them? Don't want to mention. They're still in competition? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Amesqua is based at De La Rosa's Los Angeles office where he directs the firm's banking operations. During 18 years in California public finance, he has completed more than 90 senior managed debt financings with a value exceeding $16 billion. Amesqua is chairman of the board of directors of Puente Learning Center and has served on the board since 2001. What does Puente stand for? Amesqua received his MBA at the Anderson School of Business at UCLA in 1991 and a bachelor's degree in finance from USC in 1987. Uh, we are sorry that we, when he applied to LMU, he didn't get in, so he had to uh, go to other LA universities. He holds all kinds of uh, uh, SCC licenses, a Series 7, 24, 27, 53, 63, which we have no idea what those mean and it's part of a uh, board member of the California Public Securities Asso uh, Association. Uh, full disclosure, uh, he's a, a good, well, he's a friend, uh, and I have been associated with uh, De La Rosa and Company for almost as long as I have been associated here at, at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, so what we're gonna do right now is while we're waiting for our other guests, because, uh, and by the way, they're both transportation uh, professionals and they got caught in traffic, so <laughs> gotta figure that, that one out. Okay, is I'm going to show you a couple of slides so you can get a visual sense of what we're going to be talking about. We're talking about infrastructure. Infrastructure, of course, includes transportation, water, energy, but it also includes streets and sewers and things of that nature. So first, working or do I put it over here? Let me give a, a brief introduction to Mr. Uh, Mr. Paul Taylor. He is. Uh, he is Deputy CEO of Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, uh, Metro as it's known to many of us. He joined the agency in, two, in June of 2009, which is very recent, 
Metro is the lead transportation planning and program agency for the County of Los Angeles and funds construction of numerous streets, highway and transit improvements running from bike and pedestrian improvements to new busway, rail lines, freeway carpools, sound walls. You talk about transportation, they fund it. Prior to Metro, uh, Mr. Taylor served as Deputy CEO of the Orange County Transportation Authority, oftentimes known as OCTA, since March of 2007. For the previous three years at OCTA, he had the responsibility for planning, engineering, and constructing all transportation programs and projects in Orange County. Um, he has spent over 30 years in public agency executive or consultant management major public sector capital and operation improvement programs in Southern California. As the, at the Los Angeles County Transportation Commission, LACTC, which no longer exists but was merged and became the MTA, we'll talk a little bit about that later in the program, a predecessor agency to Metro, uh, uh, Mr. Taylor served as the acting executive director Deputy Executive Director and Director of Stra Strategic Long Range Planning. He also managed the planning of Los Angeles County's rail transit system, engineering and early construction of the Metro Blue Line, and conceptual engineering for the region's commuter rail system. Uh, Mr. Taylor has directed operations, planning, service deployment, and policy development for the Southern California Rapid Transit District here in Los Angeles, another predecessor agency of Metro. He is a licensed civil engineer, has a master's and bachelor's degree from MIT, and has lectured on transportation and development at universities throughout Southern California. Metro is the third largest public transportation agency in the United States. It has 3.9 billion annual budget. Let me repeat that, $3.9 billion a year. That is more than the combined gross national product of all of Central America. So it's a significant uh, budget. It has 9,000 employees. It operates approximately, oh, that's right. So I'll, we'll comment on that one later. Uh, he operates over, not he, but the agency operates approximately 200 bus routes. I'm gonna show you those in a second. Serving 1,400 square miles in the service area. Five subway and light rail lines that crisscross LA County. Metro's total annual bus and rail ridership exceeds 400 million boardings. That's not individuals, that's uh, at different times that individuals have gotten on or off these, um, these systems, okay? So let me very quickly show you on, on a map, on the uh, PowerPoint here, some of the uh, systems that we're talking about. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about transportation. Okay. Uh, you're in the way of the uh... okay what's happening here is showing you the growth of the system from the years so in 1993 that system came up 1994 1995 we got the green line and here's the center of the universe LMU right above LAX 1996 we got that system 99, the red line up to uh, the valley. 2000, further extension of the red line. 2002, Metrolink. The gold line out to Pasadena, Colorado Boulevard. The busway in the valley. Gold line expansion. And under construction, the Expo Line. We're going to talk to Mr. Taylor about when it's going to open up. And future planning, under construction, the extension of the Orange Line up here. And then the extension of the Gold Line past Pasadena. Okay? All right. And this is on the, uh, if you want to see this again, it's on the Metro's uh, website. Okay? And so here is a real busy system. It talks about the, uh, the bus lines. So you can see the hundreds of bus lines that we have and it includes the rail line. It's a real busy map. We're gonna have this on our website so you can take a look at it in a, in a, in a more clear fashion. This is just downtown. 
Here's a system again that we just went over. You can see again the extension of the rail. And this is, uh, these are planning for new uh, uh, projects. So the extension of the Expo line uh, to the west side, the extension of the Orange line in the valley, and the extension of the Gold line out in uh, San Gabriel Valley past Pasadena. Okay, and then these are, these red lines are all the uh, rapid buses. The ones that if you're on the wrong station, it just keeps passing you by. <laughs> and here's the Metro and Metrolink map again. Okay, then California High Speed Rail, which Mr. Katz, our fourth guest when he arrives, will talk about. And here's the system going down from San Diego, Anaheim, all the way up, and then it forks to San Francisco and then Sacramento, and a proposed link here. Okay. And then this is the California Department of Transportation, mostly known as Caltrans for you guys, and it's divided into seven districts in the state. We live in the seventh district, and they're the ones that take care of the freeways for us. Okay. And then talk about energy. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, DWP as we did last week, um, and we're going to have Mr. Katz mostly talk about it. But this shows you the city of LA is all in blue, and then everything else gets serviced by Southern California Edison. So you can see that the little city of San Fernando is completely surrounded by the city of Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, and West Hollywood. This is Culver City. Okay, this is Marina del Rey, Santa Monica, LMU, again, okay, center of the universe. Okay, let's talk a little bit about water. This is the uh, aqueduct system of California, bringing water to Southern California. This is the DWP line. This is the California aqueduct, and then the Colorado aqueduct. Then here's a little bit more extensive. This is more of a, the conveyance system beyond the aqueducts, and they're all over the uh, place coming down. So all these lines. It's not very clear, but you'll be able to see it on the website. Okay? All right. All of this is just to give you a sense of the infrastructure and the billions of dollars that it's cost to build this system. Water, transportation, energy. Okay. Once again, welcome to Loyola Marymount University and the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We're going to be talking about the building and maintaining of infrastructure. We have with us uh, Mr. Jeff Keitlinger, General Manager of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Mr. Paul Taylor, the Deputy CEO of the MTA, or Metro as it's known to many of us. And Mr. Raul Amesqua from EJ De La Rosa and Company, an investment banking firm that focuses on public finance. So when you take a look at all of this, we also want one more thing here. And we were going to wait for Mr. Richard Katz to talk about this, but I'm just going to give you a, a quick brief look and measure R. Measure R is a measure that was passed in 2008 countywide that basically allowed Mr. Paul Taylor to do what he's been doing and that is to we are taxing ourselves in Los Angeles County we're adding an additional is a quarter cent or half cent uh, an additional half cent every time you go to the uh, store and buy something in that sales tax and you wonder why it's more expensive in LA County than in other counties uh, is because we, Los Angeles County voters, decided to, more, to tax ourselves more so we can build the rail system that Mr. Paul Taylor is going to be talking about. And Measure R required a two-thirds vote, is that correct? Okay, that meant that we had to get 66.7% for the, as we were talking uh, last week with uh, Mr. Joel Fox of uh, Howard Jarvis Group and, and, and others about the whole Proposition 13 and, and then additional propositions that came into the ballot and, and uh, uh, forced a two-thirds vote to increase any tax. It included the sales tax. And so LA County had a vote over two-thirds to increase that sales tax. And here you see um, LA County, uh, the vote was 68% in the county overall. It was 71% in the city of Los Angeles, a little bit better in the city than in the county. And here we have uh, how every single ethnic group voted for it in the city. This is only city data. And you can see that uh, it, it was basically every group was supportive of it. There's very little difference. But you can see Asians to a much greater degree, Latinos, African Americans than, than uh, whites. And then we'll stop right there. So we're, we're going to begin with. Um, um, 
with Mr. Keitlinger and talk a little bit about the uh, Metropolitan Water System and what the actual mission is because here in the city of Los Angeles we're used to the Department of Water and Power and that's how we get our, our water and what does MWD even it's headquartered in the city of Los Angeles how does it interact with the Department of Water and Power and how do we here at LMU uh, get impacted by what, what is happening with MWD sure thank you Fernando um, yeah, my name is Jeff Keitlinger, and I, I'm from the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. And our agency is what we call uh, a water wholesaler. And it really came about at the turn of the century when uh, William Mulholland was the leader at LA Department of Water and Power. And he spearheaded the drive to build City of Los Angeles' uh, supply line to Owens Valley. And so they built that around the turn of the century. That supplied the City of Los Angeles for the next couple of decades. Uh, they really thought it would probably last up into the 1950s, but already by the 1920s, the growth in LA was growing so fast uh, that they realized that the region was going to need more imported water supplies. And so they looked out to where was the next place they could find imported water to bring to Southern California, and the logical place was the Colorado River. And so Mulholland and his team of lawyers uh, at LADWP and the LA City Attorney's Office did the math and realized that they needed $150 million in new bonds. This is the mid-1920s. That's where $150 million really meant something. That was, that was, that was when $150 million could really buy something. It, um, that turned out to be about 18, 19% of Southern California's total assessed valuation at the time. And, and the city attorney at the time uh, told Mr. Mulholland that you couldn't afford it. The city could not do it. It didn't have enough assessed valuation to issue the bonds. But he came up with a plan, and it was bring in the suburbs. And at the time, that was Pasadena, Santa Monica, Glendale, Burbank, uh, all the cities around Los Angeles. And so they created the Metropolitan Water District, Los Angeles, and 12 other cities. Uh, they passed the bonds in 1930s, and when they started building the Colorado River Aqueduct. And so what it is now is Metropolitan uh, brings in water to Southern California. We bring in about half the water Southern California uses, and then we sell it to the cities who then do the retail work. So it was kind of a division of labor. Metropolitan do the Colorado River Aqueduct, and then later on in the 1960s, we worked with Governor Pat Brown and built the, um, the State Water Project. And so those are the two main imported supplies for Southern California. Northern California through the State Water Project and the Colorado River through the Colorado River Aqueduct. Metropolitan runs those. And then we sell the water to places like Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, who provides it out here at Loyola. So 19 million people live in the service area? Yeah, one of the unique things about uh, MWD was that it was really not designed to be a heavy political boundary. It was set up where it would grow, and its definition was the urban California coastal plain. So originally it was mainly LA County with some of the Orange County cities. Over time, as the region grew, everybody, the urban areas, would annex to Metropolitan. So right now, we are up into Ventura County in the north, all the way down to the Mexico border. Six counties, uh, about five, little 5,200 square miles, and 19 million people. When you showed that little map of California, the, that map of California it shows a pretty small sliver of yellow. That's Metropolitan Service Area, that six-county coastal area that we live in. 19 million people is half the state. We are about approximately 38 million people, and Southern California is 19 million people, and we supply the water to that 19 million. So if we didn't have metropolitan water, I mean, obviously water is what sustains us. Um, how many people could naturally live here without importing water from either the California Aqueduct, the Colorado, or uh, DWP? It, it, you know, right now, since we supply half the water, part of the answer is you think it should be half, but even that probably wouldn't work because it wouldn't be reliable. So it would have to be probably less than a third of the people that are here now. So not 19 million people, you'd be talking four or five million people would be the most Southern California could really reliably support without that backbone of imported water. So it's basically an essential service. Without the Metropolitan Water District, most of us could not be here. We would not be, the city would not be able, the cities would not be able right. to, uh, to sustain us. So what are the major challenges that you face to, today? We talk about building the system. Maybe give us a quick history about when the system was built, how it was built, and then what you are facing as challenges today. 
Yeah, the, the, there's a number of challenges, like in any infrastructure business. The uh, original challenge was how do you build a, a very expensive project in the 1930s? It, understanding it would take a decade to build this. You, we started work in 1931. Uh, we didn't deliver a drop of water to Southern California until 1941. And so people had to finance this through property taxes during the Great Depression. And it was a pretty remarkable undertaking by Southern California to do that. Uh, then as the air region continued to grow, particularly in the post-war boom, uh, even then we were running out of water again by the 60s and 70s. And so then the next big wave of construction began in the 1960s, and that was Governor Pat Brown really pushed and sponsored what was called the State Water Project. So when you drive up Highway 5 and you see that aqueduct, uh, that was a huge monumental undertaking by the state of California to supply water to Southern California, the urban area, but also all the farms of the Central Valley. And so uh, what Metropolitan agreed to do at that time was to sign on to a contract to build the State Water Project where we would pay half the cost of that every single year so the state could float the bonds, uh, whether or not we received a drop of water. Uh, so for wait a minute, that doesn't make it. That doesn't seem like a fair deal. It's Am I missing something? You're no, a lawyer. No. Well, what's <laughs> a <laughs> I, I wasn't there when they signed it in 1960. I think Pat Brown did a little bit of arm twisting at Metropolitan. There was a huge, huge, huge debate at the time, uh, but Cal Southern California signed on to it, and it's what's known in our business as a take or pay contract. I'm not sure where the or fits in because you pay and you pay and you get if you're lucky. Uh, so some years we get very little water out of the state water project during a drought. The bill is more or less the same except for the energy it takes to pump it over the mountains because we have to pay off all the infrastructure it took to do it. In a typical year, Metropolitan writes a check to the state of California for something in the neighborhood of $600 million to pay for the state water project. Uh, but it supplies, and here's a, how we measure water. We measure water in our business not in gallons but in acre feet because each acre foot is 326,000 gallons and we deliver on the neighborhood of 2 million acre feet. Well, the State Water Project delivers more than a million acre feet a year. So it's a, it's a huge supply, but it's a huge expense as well. So in your bio, it says, the general manager reports directly to the board of directors. Who are the board of directors? How many are there? What's going on there? It's a complex agency. We uh, represent 26 agencies uh, that buy water from us. They range from the large agencies like Los Angeles Department of Water and Power uh, down to a small agency like the City of San Marino or City of San Fernando. Each agency gets at least one director. The large agencies get more depending on their assessed valuation of property. So I have 26 agencies and 37 board members that I report to. Uh, so I have 37 opinions. We try to corral and move forward in a single direction. So you have 37 different bosses all with the same agenda, different agendas? Uh, how, how do you? Uh, varying agendas, as Richard knows very well. Yeah, I'm uh, going to introduce Richard in a second, then we'll all know why they're laughing. <laughs> the, one of the good things is, uh, it, it's amazing that it works at all. Uh, when you figure we represent, we deliver water to places like uh, Santa Monica, you know, extremely liberal, to Riverside, uh, conservative areas. Uh, some of our areas are very hot and inland. Other areas, uh, you know, have a lot of citrus farming. But we deliver water to urban, old Southern California. And so it's amazing that mostly it works, but it usually works because we need water and most people get it. And therefore, and it makes a lot more sense to team up and build these things. Uh, a small pipe for us is 12 feet round and some of these are 24 feet round. These are huge multi-million dollar, billion dollar projects and no city, not even in Los Angeles, can afford to build them on their own. So that's why they've teamed up together. So, but I'm assuming that the agenda really is we want water, we want to make sure we're going to get water, and we want to pay the least amount for it. So does every agency pay the same amount? They all pay the same amount. Uh, obviously, some buy more water than others, so they pay right. that way. But they pay based on what they take, and so everybody pays the same amount. Okay. Uh, as you just saw, we had a fourth member of the panel join us. Um, just to remind everybody, we're here at Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, the Urban Lecture Series on Channel 36. And we have uh, Mr. 
Richard Katz. Uh, he is the chair of Metrolink Board of Directors and he is a member of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Mr. Katz was first elected to the California State Assembly in 1980. 1980. Was your beer? Born then. No, don't read all that. <coughs> um, <laughs> the <coughs> current freshmen were born in 1993, just to remind you. Thanks that. for mentioning that. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's why I said don't read that. <laughs> Uh, full disclosure, I have to read this, okay? So, he was elected in 1980 and served continuously for 16 years. He was the Democratic leader in 1995. If many of you recall, because we've been talking about the 2008 election and how the Republicans were able to recapture the House and the constantly compared to 1994. In 1994, there was the um, great uh, uh, Newt Gingrich in the contract uh, for America, and he captured the House. Uh, and at that same time, the California State Assembly, the lower house of the California legislature was also captured by the uh, Republicans. And at that time, Richard Katz became minority leader to kind of the same position that Nancy Pelosi currently has in Congress. She's the minority leader in terms of the, in terms of the Democrats. And he then led the Democratic Party back to majority status in 1996 by capturing uh, 43 positions. Um, and, and for the Democrats to thank him, they refused to vote him as Speaker of the uh, Assembly. Oh, okay, he was termed out. He then, he then ran for the state Senate and lost by 29 votes out of 100,000 votes. That's like uh, my class is 30 kids, so that's if each one of you had voted oh, in I know. that. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, were, they, weren't, they weren't around to vote for you, Richard. So when people tell you uh, that votes don't count, that it doesn't count whether, uh, you, know, wh whether you uh, vote or not, I mean, if he had been Latino and had a large family, he would have won. <laughs> <laughs> That's assuming that they would have voted for you, right? your, own yeah, your yeah. own family. So, so he very much involved in, in, in uh, politics. Um, he, of course, he was trimmed out, and, uh, but uh, for 10 years he served as the chair of the powerful Assembly Transportation Committee. He authored Proposition uh, 111 or 111, a 10-year transportation blueprint passed by the voters. He created congestion management plan requiring cities and counties to measure and mitigate the impacts of land use decisions on their streets, highways, and transit systems. Uh, some of his accomplishments include laws he wrote dealing with prison reform, groundwater protection, computer education, a hundred million dollar uh, school bus replacement program, mono lake restoration, uh, land water, uh, landmark water uh, legislation, I can just go on and on. Um, after he left uh, the uh, uh, elected position, he was chair of Angelinos for Better Classrooms, which led to the successful 1997 campaign to pass a $2.4 billion L.A. school bond, which led to the uh, building of 100 more schools in L.A. Unified, and it also led to other bonds, which I think went up uh, over $7 billion that were passed after that one bond ha had, had passed. Um, he also was California's lead negotiator for the landmark Colorado River Agreement between the state of California, the federal government, four California water agencies, and six Colorado River Basin states. So he had a deal with six states, the federal government, all of the different municipalities, yeah. and, and Jeff, yeah. and Jeff, <laughs> who I think was an attorney at that point, all right? The lead counsel. Um, further, yeah, oh, yeah, he's still an attorney. Uh, his expertise as a negotiator on issues of statewide significance. Uh, Katz has already played a pivotal role in renegotiating $30 billion worth of California energy contracts and developing the California Transportation Blueprint. So he's involved in, in everything. Shortly after uh, Mayor Viragosa was elected in 2005, he appointed um, uh, Mr. Katz to serve with him on the governing board of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority that Mr. Taylor works for. And after the horrific Metrolink accident in 2008, the mayor appointed uh, Mr. Katz to the Metro, uh, Metrolink board, which he now serves as chair. He previously also served on the high-speed rail, is that correct? Until you, are you still on the high-speed no. rail? Okay. I think you were threatened with uh, uh, some type of legal action if you didn't get off or something of that nature. I was volunteering on too many pro bono boards apparently. So, so <laughs> all of this, he's completely and heavily involved in transportation in California, water in California, energy in California. He does all of this for free. 
Okay? Therefore, he has to have his, a job, and he is the owner of a successful public policy government relations firm based in Los Angeles. It's got a very unique name. He did a lot, a lot of marketing to come up with a name. It's called Richard Katz Consulting. <laughs> <coughs> RKC, for short, offers a wide variety of services, including strategic advice, message development, et cetera, et cetera. He's basically a guy, given that he's involved with, with every major issue in California, was involved in politics for 16 years. He knows where everybody is buried, more importantly, who buried it, and who would get in trouble if it got uncovered. And that is uh, some, uh, a guy you, you want to know. So, Mr. Richard Katz. Now, if I um, could have only gotten here on time, it would have been perfect. So well, my apologies to you and to your students. Yeah, we know you're a transportation expert. That's why Checking you were the roads. Uh, that's <laughs> right. That's right. So um, we were ta talking about water. We're going to be talking a lot about transportation. And one of the key things about it, of course, is you not only have to build it, you have to maintain it. And all of that costs money. And as you know, any of you know that when you want to build something major in your own property, whether it's a house or you want to buy a house, you don't have that money in your pocket. You have to borrow that money. And one of the uh, guests that we have here uh, is uh, Raul Amesqua, who works for uh, De La Rosa and Company. And he has been involved in the financing of these projects, both at Metropolitan Water District and at the uh, MTA. And so when um, Mr. Keitlinger was talking about you know, back in the old days, borrowing $150 million. Uh, and you guys, uh, I think the MTA just did a, a, a $4 billion uh, offering not too long ago. And so, Raul, who do you sell these bonds to? How, what's the process in terms of trying to get money for a metropolitan water district, the MTA? And who would, uh, who would buy these? And if you were going to buy a $5,000 bond from the MTA or a $5,000 bond from the MWD and you only had $5,000, which one would you buy? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <clears throat> so who would buy these bonds? Uh, Get a little closer to the mic. The uh, municipal bond market, as it's called, also referred to as the tax-exempt market, uh, is basically the fourth largest capital market in, in, uh, in the United States. There's about uh, three, three and a half trillion dollars worth of municipal bonds that are outstanding. Currently, uh, there's about 350 to 450 billion new bonds that get issued every single year. So the market is really huge. Uh, the investors run the gamut uh, from mutual funds and uh, insurance companies, uh, corporations, uh, you know, some banks, uh, some pension systems, et cetera, et cetera. But the real driver of the municipal bond market are folks who could take advantage of the tax-free nature of the bonds. So it's basically a federal government subsidy to local agencies to help them finance infrastructure by allowing them to issue bonds that if they issued them on a, on a taxable basis would have an interest rate of, say, 8%. But because they're tax-free to the investor, they get to issue the bonds at 5%. So in theory, they can issue more debt, build more projects. The investors basically get tax-free income, so they're pretty happy. So, But you mean tax-free income, they invest $5,000, and whatever income they earn, interest, right. interest excuse me, is not taxed. Correct. Okay, but they did pay a tax on the initial 5000 Maybe. Well, to get the $5,000, hopefully yeah. they did it the right way and paid the, their, their, uh, their taxes. But, so when people ask me often, you know, who are these individuals? It's really, when you really think about it, the, the, the folks who buy municipal bonds are really truly the high net worth individuals who could take maximum advantage of the tax free income. So it's people who are at, typically at the highest marginal tax rates. So they would include folks like Kobe Bryant, they would include folks who are you know, entrepreneurs, just cashed out a ton of money on the sale of their company and they need to park their money somewhere. Uh, a lot of retirees, uh, a lot of people who want safety versus putting money in, in the stock market. But out of the three plus trillion dollars in the municipal bond market, um, about two trillion is uh, indirectly or directly uh, individual investors. So uh, when you can buy, there's, you said trillion, so you can buy a uh, bond from Met, Metro, or the city of Bell, okay? And they all, so why, how do you distinguish which one to buy? Um, well, for most of you folks, I would say that uh, you should buy either one because they're both rated AAA, uh, and that is basically the highest rating you could possibly have. The federal government has a AAA rating. 
basically means that uh, there is a probability of you know point zero 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 one that they would not pay you on a timely basis. Uh, I myself would probably buy the city of Bell bonds uh, because the city of Bell bonds right now probably are trading at twenty cents on the dollar. Now this is not advice because he doesn't know your individual situation, so don't tell you don't, what I would do. Yeah. Tell you what I would do. But, but the, the disclaimer for anyone listening that <laughs> yeah, please. Fernando Guerra and LMU are not responsible <laughs> for any losses you may suffer right, in the right, market. Right, or, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, but what happens in the in the municipal bond market when a situation like Bell occurs is that all these investors who bought those bonds who thought they were, you know, extremely safe and there was no risk that they were not uh, going to get paid, panic. And they don't want those bonds. Even if they sat down oftentimes and looked through the facts and looked at history and said, I will get paid back, oftentimes they'll say, I still don't want that bond. So what happens is there's many folks trying to sell those bonds, very few people willing to buy them. The price just plummets dramatically. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, the city of Bell will probably get through what they're going through right now. There will be some restructuring. Bondholders will eventually get paid, and if you bought something at 20 cents on the dollar and eventually get paid something closer to 100 cents on the dollar, you're going to make a ton of money. So, my favorite story about this is when Orange County went bankrupt uh, many years ago, uh, and their bonds were trading at 30 cents on the dollar. Uh, the County of Orange, Florida bonds were trading at like 50 cents on the dollar, and you ask why? Because of the name. Basically, any county that had fruit in their name was trading at a penalty because investors did not want to have to explain County of Orange, Florida. Okay, I don't want to go through that, that, that process and have to explain to folks that this is a good credit. So they just basically you know, dumped those bonds and, and there's buying opportunities. So if the municipal bond market, the tax exempt bond market didn't exist, how would Met or Metro be able to build the infrastructure that we have? Uh, you know, basically uh, one of two ways. It would uh, either take a really, really long time for them to build the projects that they have built. You mean to this longer point. than the Expo line is taking? <laughs> <laughs> it would take. That's a quick one. Uh, yeah, it would take uh, decades and centuries because basically, and, and, and centuries, right? Because when you issue debt, you basically say, "I'm going to borrow whatever 100 million, a billion dollars." to build this project and I'm going to pay you back over 30 years. Most of the time that project will last for at least 30 years, maybe more. But if you didn't have the bond market access to capital that way, you would basically have to accumulate the revenue. And it might take you 30 years to accumulate that amount of revenue. So you wouldn't be able to build anything until you accumulated that amount of cash. And guess what would happen by then? The cost of that project uh, would probably be you know, astronomically higher because of inflation. Uh, probably environmental costs would be higher, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So nothing would get built um, if you didn't have access to the market. Uh, I think Southern California would be a quarter of the size, uh, maybe. Well, we say, but how long has the tax exempt market been around? I think the uh, since the first part of the century, since uh, the government, uh, federal government, imposed uh, federal income taxes. I think it was like 1900 or 1904, something along those lines, where the city of New York first issued uh, tax exempt municipal debt. Okay, but so then how did they build infrastructure before that? How were the railroads built? How were the subways of New York built? Um, I think, uh, you know. How was Rome built? Right, how was Rome built? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you could do, aside from accumulating cash, is tax yourself a lot more. And uh, back then, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, a lot of people were willing to uh, tax themselves more to build the needed infrastructure because it was very imminent. So I think uh, people, uh, you know, were much more willing to tax themselves at higher levels to get projects done because they needed the road, they needed the water than they would be today. Paul Taylor is deputy CEO of Metro. Um, how did you get to LMU today? Working. Yes. I drove my car. <laughs> what percentage of Angelinos take public transportation? Um, probably about 5%. And for us to free up the freeways, what percent would have to take public transportation? Um, my personal prediction would be we would never free up the freeway. Everybody took public transportation. Oh, no, that's, that's not true. I'll disagree with Paul. Paul's an expert. I just play at it. But so, but wait. Let me make sure that people understand the dynamics here. We were earlier talking to uh, Mr. Keitlinger about his board of directors, and that the board of directors can fire and hire him. 
Uh, Mr. Katz is on the board of MTA. Mr. Taylor works for the MTA. So Mr. Katz is his boss. No, not really. Um, <laughs> we just like to think we are, but we know who actually runs the place, and it's guys like Paul and Art Leahy and the folks that do the hard work. And Paul and I don't really, it's not a disagreement about it. It's, you know, back, another reference before you were born, back when the Olympics, there's two times in Los Angeles when traffic's good. Midnight? 1984 oh. in the Olympics, and Jewish holidays. Jewish holidays. So you either need to bring the Olympics back or have more Jewish holidays. I mean, either of those. This, uh, this is a but Catholic university that we'd be willing to have. We could work out Jewish something. Holidays. I mean, we could work out something yeah. here. The, um, I mean, but what you, need to, what you need to think about in terms of traffic, though, and this is why what Paul's doing and the MTA is doing is so important, is there is no one solution to free up the freeways. Just like Jeff doesn't have one solution to free to make water work for everybody, there's not one solution because it's different depending on where you live and what you have access to. And part of what the MTA's in the lead on is trying to create a new system here in LA. But the Olympics were a 5% reduction in traffic on the road. And everybody thought they sort of died and went to heaven at that point because you could move around LA. Because, and what it shows is that you don't have to take a lot of people, but you gotta have alternatives that a lot of people can access. And so, you know, in today's world, that 5% is probably closer to 10% that you give options to. For instance, if everybody in LA either worked from home, worked from home one day a week or ride share, took, you know, shared a ride or took mass transit one day a week, that's literally a 20% reduction on people driving on any single day. And if you think back to the Olympics being a 5% reduction, imagine what a 20% reduction would do. And I think all of us who did this many, many years ago made mistakes and among them, when ride sharing was rolled out, ride sharing was sort of rolled out as something you have to do every day. And people said, I can't do that every day. We should have taken a lesson from the almond growers. And I think people have seen those commercials that, you know, one can a week is all we ask. If we had asked everybody to do something. Those are all, they don't know those commercials. Those commercials stopped running like 10, 12 years ago. No, the almond ago. guys are back and the cranberry uh, How many of you guys know what he's talking about? Raise your Somebody hand if pistachios. you know what it's he's talking about. It's on pistachios. It's on, yeah, never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> 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 Dr. Singleton knows. Thank you, Dr. Singleton. I appreciate that. Um, I'll get you a Metro Pass. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, let, no, but, but it, so all I'm trying to say is that people often say, look how expensive it is to build a subway or do this, because they only look at the cost on the subway. And you've got to look at the cost, and I know Jeff does this when spreading costs at Metropolitan, it's called a postage stamp rate that spreads it throughout the whole system. When you look at all the costs for the subway or whatever it is, not, don't just look at the subway, look at the person that's not on the freeway, look at the person who's not polluting, who's not driving a car. I mean, there's a system-wide benefit that that cost needs to be looked at in context with because all of those solutions are necessary in Los Angeles. Yeah. So you're involved. That's what I, that's what I meant. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what, it, I, what I, what you get drawing, drawing though from what, from what Richard says is that unless we all get involved in not driving everywhere, we're going to have congested streets and freeways because we're all trying to get to too many places, too many similar places at the same time, except on Jewish holidays. So, um, and by the way, I, it's the easy for me because I just say things. Paul actually has to go build them. So, you know, when it's one thing for me to say that's where we're going. If Paul tells you how we're going to get there, that's much more likely to happen. So that get, brings me. Finds the money for it. Uh, this brings me to a point. Mr. Taylor went to MIT. Do you have an engineering degree? Yeah, from San Diego State. So you do have an engineering degree? No. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't have an engineering degree. <laughs> kind of a question. I don't have an engineering degree. Of course okay, not. So why, how, why are you the most one of the most influential people involved in all this engineering and all that. Why, well, Paul, let me ask. Actually, actually, that's actually, let me, let me, I'm just let me older ask, than everybody else. Let me ask Paul. Why is what skill set does Richard? Because he's not an engineer. <laughs> so what skill set does he have to be involved in every single major infrastructure <laughs> issue facing California? ADHD. He has he has he has yeah he has he never sleeps, um, and he is interested in every damn thing there is. And, um, and he's really smart. And he's so old. He's almost as old as I am. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is that to build these systems, you not only need the, um, 
the, the engineering expertise that uh, uh, Mr. Taylor has, the legal and contracts and negotiation that uh, Mr. Keitlinger has, but you also need the uh, political skill or the social engineering, that's the type of degree that he has, that, that brings a lot of these people together to be able to talk about, about this. You need the buy-in of the community, you need the buy-in of all kinds of different uh, elected officials. Um, given of all these issues that you've been uh, um, dealing with, which was the, from your perspective, the most important and then the most difficult, they may not be the same ones, to be able to accomplish? It's, it's hard to say what's most important because it, it really, cha you know, it depends on the circumstances and the time. There are things that were very important at the time. I'm sure as everybody, knows, there are things that seem really important to you at the time that a year or two later suddenly don't seem so important. I mean, I can like, tell you. Uh, like 29 votes? Like 29 votes, which I got over, um, but I can name 17 of them. But um, no, I'm, um, <laughs> no, you know, in, in a funny, but I will tell you something, though. Let me come off that for one second, because this, I think, is important for, for folks to know. I learned a lot from losing the race. You know, it's, people think that losing is the end of the world, and, and for some people it may be. Um, but I got to tell you that, um, that my life's probably better than if I had won. Uh, that the things I've been able to do, I would doubt I'd have a four-year-old kid right now if I had gone to the state senate in those years. I doubt that um, my business and a lot of the other things I'm doing and my family would be where it is. Um, I think the worst thing in the world is not trying. You don't have to win every time. You don't have to make it every time. You want to, and that's great, but not trying and wondering if I could have is something you guys ought to do everything you can to avoid, what you don't want to be. And that was what I went through when I first went, ran for office. What I didn't want to be was somebody who sat there as I got older in life and said, I could have been but for. Right. Put it out there. Take a chance. Take a risk. You know, the things I tell candidates, that when you run for office, you find out two things. Two things, you find out a lot of things, but one, you're grossly, dis you're majorly disappointed by the people you've known forever, some people who you expect to come through and, and don't. And that's a big disappointment. But it's more than offset by all the people that come out and participate that you don't, you've never met before, you don't know, but they heard a speech you gave or read something about you or they have a question, they want to get involved. And that's just an amazing experience. How old were you when you got elected? I got elected, I was 30 when I got elected. Um, so, so the stu and I think, you know, in some ways, everything you're doing is important to somebody. Ironically, of all the bills I worked on in the legislature, and I, I wrote the first domestic partner law in the country to reach a governor's desk, and Pete Wilson vetoed it. Um, I wrote the toughest groundwater protection law in the country, which became law and the transportation stuff and other water stuff. But one of the hardest bills to pass, and it took me five years, which is almost embarrassing to say, was a bill to require sand rock and gravel trucks to be covered. Now, that sounds pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. And anybody who's ever driven behind one or been on a freeway when a sand rock or gravel truck's coming by knows the problem, you know. Um, but it was, but it took five years because, Why? because, because the folks who had the trucks who were moving the gravel and moving the aggregate had a good deal going. You know, you had all this stuff flying off their trucks that they weren't responsible for and they didn't want to change. It was going to cost them some money. And if their truck caused a problem today, it didn't cost them money. It cost us and our insurance companies money, which also cost us more money in the end. So it, it took a long time. It was an interest group with clout, and it took a long time. It took five years to get it passed. So a lot of what, uh, I mean, politics is involved in every single one of these issues that we're talking about. So let's talk about Measure R and the idea of Measure R. Uh, Measure R, as we showed up at, at the, um, uh, on the PowerPoint, was an initiative in 2008 that required a two-thirds vote to raise the uh, sales tax uh, um, a half a cent. What's going to happen with that money? It's going to be spent, it's going to be collected over the next 30 years and it's going to be spent uh, probably sooner than that over I would say the next 10 or so years, maybe longer. Uh, 40 billion dollars will be collected over that 30 year period and it'll be spent about half on um, projects to expand the rail and, the, and operate and expand the rail transit and bus transit system, and about half on other things, including um, highway, freeway improvements, street improvements, 
uh, carpooling improvements, goods movement improvements, and the like. It's also going to create probably 90,000 jobs a year on average in our county. 90,000 jobs a year. That's a pretty good return on investment. We, we, we fork over another half cent sales tax you know, on our sales tax, and we get 90,000 90, additional people get, get work. Now, were you surprised that it passed by the, I mean, obviously it has to have a two-thirds vote, but were you surprised that it passed? Because um, many people were thinking that it wasn't going to pass given the countywide. There was all kinds of debate about uh, certain areas not getting as much transportation as others. Yeah, no, I think you get a two-thirds vote on a measure that raises sales tax in 2008 in the middle of the biggest recession in the country's hit since the Great Depression, and, you know, you've got to consider yourself lucky that it passed, clearly. Um, Mayor Villaraigosa, uh, Supervisor Yaroslavsky, and others went out there early and were committed. Uh, we were able to put together a very unique coalition of environmentalists, businesses, labor, um, who all pulled together and literally, you know, and, and got this thing through. And I think the reason it passed is, as the mayor said, he's, he expressed, it's a vision for the county. And people, you know, I think the voters are often ahead of the politicians and the elected officials. You know, the, some of the politicians who opposed this were still doing it because there wasn't enough in their backyard. And the voters understood that I don't really care whose backyard I'm in when I'm stuck on the freeway. I just want to know why it's not moving. And, you know, you go down San Fernando Road or you go down Sepulveda or you go down Lincoln. You go through how many different cities between the time you start and the time you stop. You don't really care what jurisdiction that you're in. You just want it to move. And I think the regional nature of the plan had a lot of appeal for a lot of people, and that's part of why it passed. Well, I know I voted for it because I wanted more mass transit so that I could uh, drive my car easier. It's uh, one of the. Well, those. that's generally you know people you know people in Los Angeles uh, uh, use mass transit. Uh, use mass. I you know it's the, exactly what you said, Fernando. I I want you to use it so you get out of Jeff's way and my way on the freeway. Right. You know, I mean, that's what people think about. But because the system isn't as convenient as it should be, and just the completion of the carpool lane on the South 405 all the way through from the 118 to Orange County makes a huge difference because it connects. The problem with LA right now is whether it's carpool lanes, whether it's freeways, whether it's bus or with the transit system, mass transit system, it doesn't connect to enough things, so you can't really go where you want to go. But you take a look at the next piece of Measure R, which is 3010, which um, Raoul's group is part of organizing the financing for. Um, so 30, explain 3010. 30, 3010 was the, the, the second part that came after Measure R passed, where the mayor who... It's not a bomb measure, it's an initiative. Well, 3010 is a, pol it's a policy, policy. Initiative, policy initiative that basically says, let's take the 12 mass transit projects in Measure R, and rather than build them over 30 years, let's build them in 10 years. You know, I'm just, you know, since the mayor is one of the few people who is less patient than I am, which is serious. Um, I'm just glad he didn't say five. You know, and Paul's especially glad he didn't say five. But what we're trying to do is literally drop a mass transit system on LA, one that has the gold line extends out um, on in the east side. We have the, um, the east side extension. You have Expo Phase 1, Expo Phase 2, the subway going to the, to the Veterans Hospital, uh, Canoga expansion in the valley. You have a lot, those 12 mass transit projects, we want to get online in 10 years because it makes not just a huge difference in air quality for everybody, it makes a dramatic difference in how that impacts on kids in particular, environmental justice communities, people who live near freeways, the jobs that Paul's talking about. So, but Measure R said you were going to build these projects over 30 years because you needed the $4 billion. So if you build it in 10 years, how do you do that? Well, and that's, that's what we're working at. First of all, Measure R is moving forward. So these 12 projects, for instance, are already being designed. Environmental work is already being done. And what the mayor and I have gone back to D.C. several times now, Paul's been back a couple times, as is Art Leahy, working with the federal uh, Art, government. Art Leahy is the CEO of MTA. So yeah, who we both work for, I guess. You know, um, who started as a bus driver for, for MTA's predecessor 40 years ago. Easy. And was fired by the MTA. And was, and was fired by the MTA. Was fired by the uh, MTA. 15 years ago. So went to Purgatory in Minnesota, 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 northern Minnesota. Does anybody know where Minnesota is? <laughs> the part by the really cold part of it is where <laughs> he was, but then Orange County, then he came back. But no, it is, it, which is also a good lesson. But, you know, it is a very, it is a very important lesson that, you know, the MTA is really made up of folks just like everybody in this room. And so 
the idea is to build these things, these projects, connect them, and do it as quickly as possible. So what we're, we're looking to Washington to help us do is not to pay for it, but to help us move $9 billion of the 40, but move $9 billion up into the construction year so we can build all these things and take advantage of, because of the recession, cheaper construction costs, cheaper material costs, and get more bang for our buck. I know MET does that on projects now. You're, out, you're trying to get projects built now. Yep. Because money's, money's available, where, where you can, with your rating, money's available, but construction prices are just lower today. So everything's cheaper, labor, cement, steel, and all that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, what, what percent cheaper is it right now? It's, it's anywhere from 20 to 40 percent cheaper. Our bid prices are coming in, so we're trying to fast track projects as much as we can right now. And it's, when you say fast track, are you able to do that even though there may be opposition, no. environmental? <laughs> and what, so no. to, to talk, <laughs> talk about your frustration in terms of trying to fast track. I mean, it's easy to say I want to fast track one of these projects, but then somebody gets in the way. Who gets in the way and why? Um, mostly everybody. Uh, California, <laughs> California is an impossible place to get things done. and. It's amazing it works as well as it does, really. I, it, it is, you know, I love the state. I, I was born here, and I, and I want to make it work, but we, we put so many restrictions in front of ourselves, and then we say, let's have 100% consensus in the most diverse place in the world before we move forward. But even water, we all know we need water. <clears throat> we need water. Go build a peripheral canal and see how if you get the north to agree with the south, with the farmers, with the cities, with the uh, ags and the urbans and the Republicans and the Democrats. This is tell, California. Tell the students stuff. what the peripheral canal is. I, I realize that's all before your time as well. Um, <laughs> California, it's coming up again though, so this is a good refresher. Uh, before you tell a story, raise your hand if you're from Northern California. <clears throat> okay. Remember, now, wait, take a look uh, at the Northern Californians. Oh, okay. You guys keep your hands up, and at, let me ask you this. Were you, do you believe Southern California is stealing your water? And keep it up or put it down if you think or not. Okay. I, I, <laughs> I, I, give, the, I give talks up in um, Santa Clara and Berkeley, and I, I ask these people if they know where their water comes from. And, you know, they don't really know where their water comes from. Do they know what a peripheral canal is? No, they've never heard of it. Do you believe Southern California is stealing your water? And it's pretty much every kid goes, yeah, that mart I know. Uh, Don't they teach that in the they, third grade? They must teach that somehow, or their parents do. Uh, you know, everywhere on the coast in California gets their water and has to bring it in. The coast is where the people live, and the coast doesn't have enough water. So San Francisco takes their water from, you know, the Yosemite's Twin Valley, Hetch Hetchy, and brings it there. Same thing with Oakland, same thing with the Silicon Valley, all like Southern California does. But the bulk of the water is in Northern California. So when Southern California moves it from north to south instead of east to west like we do in the rest of the state, all of a sudden it becomes very political. Well, here, here's the, the map. That we, if you look in this middle area, right there is called the San Francisco Bay Delta. It is an area that is as flat as this table, and we try to push water through these canals, and it doesn't work very well and it moves very slowly. It gets all these endangered species fish issues. We have problems with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Endangered Species Act. So they came up with a bright idea, and this is in the 70s, that we're going to build a canal and go around it. Uh, it's you know, just a bypass, a simple canal. We're gonna make a loop around this bay delta, and that will separate the ecosystem from our drinking water. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown, who you may have heard of, uh, was a young guy at the time, and he agreed, he signed the bill to put it on the ballot. It went on the ballot and it lost, but it was a pretty close vote. But it passed everywhere in Southern California, but it passed by about a 60-40 margin. When you hit Santa Clara County, which is at the south end of the Bay Area, uh, that's when every county started voting no. Santa Clara voted no on it on a 90 to 10 no, and it went downhill from there. San Francisco was 98 and a half percent no, uh, which, you know, is stunning when you think about it. I think there were like 12 people, and I suspect they probably just hit the wrong <laughs> box by accident. They meant to say no. I was living in Northern California at the time as a student, and it was just amazing the animosity that came out in Northern California that you're we stealing, were not going to You're stealing build our this. water. You're stealing our water, and they voted no. I mean, you know, even, even Stalin even wouldn't fake at, those numbers. If you look at this map, you even see San Francisco stealing water. They get their water from Hetch Hetchy over here. Everybody does. comes down. Every right. major city uh, other than Sacramento, where all the water goes past it in Fresno, every other place on the coast has to get their water and move it there. But 
uh, that that was a huge north-south issue. And okay, so Northern California gets in our way. Well, the big irony of ironies is they get in our way. Except the the right. Peripheral Canal is going to come back. It is coming back in the next year on because we, again, it has to be built because of these endangered species issues. Does it need two-thirds vote or 50 percent? Um, it needs, if it goes on the ballot, it's a 50 percent vote. We're trying to structure it so we don't even have to go on the ballot. But I just think it's amazing that a generation later, Jerry Brown is governor again, and he's going, the exact same issue? You've got to be kidding me. Here we go again. <laughs> But it's, it's coming up. In the next two years, we're going to make a decision as a state whether or not we go back and finish the peripheral canal. We kicked the can down the road in 1982. So there are uh, geographic rivalries or divisions. That gets in the way. Environmental issues get in the way. What else gets in the way? Money. Um, money's a tough issue. Uh, this, you know, in California, it you used got to you be. got Raul right next to you. He We've says he, he says he'll get you <clears throat> billions. He gets us billions, and he does a darn good job of it. Uh, but. We're, we're, something new is happening in California. We're, we used to just be growing so fast that you could build infrastructure based on growth. In other words, the new people coming in were funding it, and we were really just adding on to our system. Our system's now older. Um, our system, Maintain Metropolitan's, yeah. we have to go back and now replace all our 70-year-old concrete in addition to building new concrete for people. And it's the first time we've had to do it in California. And all of a sudden, people are going, you mean your, are my water rate's going to go up about 7% a year? That's above inflation? And I go, yes, because inflation keeps it going, and we still have to grow it at the same time. That's a hard political lesson, and it happens, transportation, everything. So in 2010, the population really didn't grow that much. The economy was slow in 2009 and 2010. Did we need less water in 2009 and 10 than you have projected that we were going to need? Yes, and, and that's another irony of problems, because normally when people use less water, they say, terrific, you know, that makes your job easier. I go, yes, but I finance everything when people buy water. So I like it when people can serve, but I also then say, but I got to raise rates because I have to finance everything that has to be built. So you said that you're not, you're a wholesaler, so you don't, so when you raise rates, you raise rates for the DWP or Orange that's County, right. you don't raise, and then they have to raise rates for the, the end, end user. Correct. So why do you care if you raise rates? The end users, are, there's no political... Yeah. I, I, I don't get a lot of people coming at my board meeting and screaming about raising rates, but they do come to DWP's meeting and scream about them raising rates. And then the four DWP people that sit on my board say, I don't like that, so you don't raise your rates. And so I get it indirectly. So we're here at Loyola Marymount University talking to uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Keitlinger, General Manager of the Metropolitan Water District, um, Mr. Raul Amesqua, uh, Head of Investment Banking for De La Rosa and Company, uh, Mr. Paul Taylor, Deputy CEO of the MTA or Metro, and Mr. Richard Katz, too many titles to list, it would take the rest of the program. But uh, we are going to have students ask questions, especially those that want a good grade, an extra point. <laughs> and so they will be lining up over here to uh, ask some questions. Um, so, uh, Richard. Where are we going? Stump the panelists get a... <laughs> yeah, yeah, stump, yeah. stump the panelists get an extra point. Yes, sir. So, so um, you've been going back to Washington on this 3010 plan. Uh, you've been going with uh, Mayor Viragosa, and you're asking the federal government to lend you money, or to, or what's the, you mentioned a $9 billion up front. And, and what's the ration, what's the argument? Let me, let's say I'm Congressman X, mm -hmm. okay? And you come into my, and I'm not a Congress, I'm a, I'm a member of Congress on an important committee, but not from Southern California. Let me say I'm a rural Republican, okay? Yeah, I That's probably don't go in your office. Okay. <laughs> so who's that, who, who, what committee is the most important in Congress? What congressman have you been talking to? Well, I mean, no, it, it, no. It's, and, and what's the argument? No, for now, it's, it's, it's the exact right question because we develop, when we talk about 3010, you know, building, you know, these projects in 10 years instead of 30, that's a very localized brand for Los Angeles. And the challenge to us is how do you fashion that program so it has more national appeal to be used in other cities? And just to show you how... You know, the importance of politics in this whole process. Last year, when the Democrats were in charge of both houses, the part of the argument for 3010 was it reduces greenhouse gases, it cleans up the air quality, um, that if you are, 
that we want to make this available for people who have taxed themselves like LA and other counties, but for non-greenhouse gas producing projects, et cetera, et cetera. With the change in the House, we've been told, you know, very, not so subtly, and, you know, we were pretty well thought of, you know, along this line that we're not arguing about, we're not discussing greenhouse gas as the reason for it with the new Congress. But since the Republicans have taken over in the Congress, they're not as interested in the leadership as the greenhouse gas issue as they are in uh, stimulating the private sector, um, creating jobs, and a number of other things. So you change the, I mean, our program still does the same thing, but you emphasize different things. So we've been talking to Chairman Micah, who's the Republican chairman from Florida of the House uh, Infrastructure Committee. Uh, we have, you know, one of our strong supporters on the Senate side was Senator Boxer, who carried this last year and made a lot of progress for us on it. We've already gotten some, you know, $560 million for the Crenshaw piece, the Crenshaw line. So we will meet with both Democrats and Republicans who are on uh, appropriations or finance committees, who are on uh, the Transportation Committee on either the Senate or the Assembly, uh, Transportation Infrastructure, Transportation and Public Works. And what we will try and do, and through the MTA, we're reaching out to counterparts of the MTA in other cities that correspond to whose members sit on these committees. So we say, you know, if, you, if this program is going to work in Denver or Atlanta or Chicago or New York, well, how would it have to be different than what we put together so that you can take advantage of it too? So that's how you try and fashion. Okay, it. so it hasn't been approved. No, well, we well it, in pieces. And what what has been approved is treating the subway as one project for environmental work, which saves us a couple of years and several million dollars on the environmental side. Five hundred sixty million has already been given to Crenshaw. Um, the Crenshaw line we got last year. We've had other money for grants. So we have some money, and the feds have told us that the subway and the downtown connector are prime candidates to be included in what's called the New Starts program, which will finance part of that program. But our main pitch, going back to your, your question, Fernando, our, part of our main pitch is most people go to Washington and they say, I have this great project. If you give me 80% of the money, we'll put up 20% of the money, and that's traditionally how transportation infrastructure has been funded. We're going back there and saying, we don't want that. What we want is we'll put up 80% of the money ourselves locally because our taxpayers have said they would. What we need from Washington is about 20% of it to help write down the interest costs so we can afford to borrow the money to do all these programs that we're talking about doing. And so that's what we're working them on. One thing that I would have, particularly for the students, and I think everyone up here would agree to, because you were asking about actually getting them built in political consensus. The harder, as hard as it is for elected officials to count, reach consensus on what ought to move forward, it's significantly harder to hold that consensus with the community in particular as the project's being built. And that's something that everybody up here struggles with. We can all agree on getting it done, but then when you get down to the details of what block it is and where you're putting your equipment and how you're making it happen, then you find all sorts of people who were for it but for. You know, and that's what makes these things difficult, is the amount of time it takes to actually get it done because, as Jeff said, we have more people that participate here in the process. We have a process that has more access than any other process in the country and more points where people can weigh in. It's both a good and a bad thing. So one last question for Mr. Taylor, then I'm going to turn it over to the students. So your job is to do all the planning, prepare for all the construction, get everything ready. How do you do that when Mr. Katz and the mayor are in D.C. trying to get some money, but you don't know whether they're going to get it, and you know, you, you, all the variables aren't laid out for you right now. How, in that environment, we've already seen what Mr. Keitlinger said about how difficult it is. You have an, another variable here that you don't know whether you're going to have one, two, three, or four billion dollars in the next two or three years, but yet you're being asked to make all these plans. That's right. <clears throat> but we, first of all, I, I don't do it myself. We have uh, a staff that is led by people who have degrees in engineering, people who have degrees in architecture, in planning, in political science, in sociology, in geography, so it's a big tent. Um, but what we do, it, we're, we're in a period where it doesn't matter um, how fat, when, when we fin are gonna finish these projects, there's a certain amount of groundwork, a certain amount of planning and design that needs to take place no matter what the schedule is going to be. So we are going as fast as you, we humanly can uh, for the next couple years. And so basically, if we don't, we, we'll reach that, that point that you're concerned about in terms of do we go, keep going or not in about two years. Okay. Questions? 
Hello, my name is Dominic Bell. I am a junior, and I'm in Dr. Garrett's class. I'd like to address this question uh, to Mr. Uh, Paul Taylor. In the dealing with you, uh, MTA, uh, now that it is like basically its own government monster, uh, the question you said that uh, Measure R deals with the allocation or the sales tax of uh, half a cent, right? Do you take into consideration in your planning along with that the economic aspects? For example, it's not just about creating 90,000 new jobs, but uh, also in the future years about them retiring and pensions and things like that. Do you, so you, do, you, do you take that into consideration when you're doing your planning? Not just the way that it affects jobs, but the overall economy, specifically now that we're in this economic downturn. Um, yeah, we do, um, in, in a number of ways. First of all, we're responsible. This is the third half-cent sales tax that the voters of LA County have entrusted to the MTA. The first was in 1980, the second was in 1990, and then this one in 2008. Um, we are duty-bound, our board and our, and our management, <clears throat> to be good stewards of that money and to make sure that it's used for the purposes that it was intended to be used for, and in fact, on the schedule for the specific projects that it was intended for. Um, if we let costs get out of control, if we let uh, expenditures get out of control, yes, even pensions get out of control, uh, we're not gonna be able to, to meet those goals, and so we, uh, we can't let that happen. Um, as we look at cities such as San Francisco with the Muni and the BART, and you have DC with the Metro um, with strikingly successful and highly used transit systems. Do you think that the development of the LA rail systems will successfully service the needs and tastes of all socioeconomic groups? Yeah, why, why can't we be like San Francisco? Um, well, because they're a tiny little place. Yeah. They have half a million people in the city and, uh, and they have about three square miles or something to, to serve. So size is a major issue. Size is a major Is there is any other issue. metro system in the United States that services such a large area? As ours? Uh-huh. No. no. How in fact, about I, here, here's a point. We have, right now we have, we have 70 miles of rail, okay. of rail transit. You mean completed, working, done. Completed or in, in operation. We're talking about the blue we line, also, the red line. We also have 2,000 buses mm -hmm. operating on several hundred bus lines that are really the backbone of the, the, the of the way people get around in LA and our job is to interface and coordinate the buses and the rail but uh, 100 years ago now remember 70 miles of rail transit today 100 years ago can anybody guess how many miles of rail transit LA County had 1,000 1,000 that was before freeways before very many uh, boulevards there was a thousand miles of rail transit and the the development patterns that exist today in Los Angeles were set and established largely by the, 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 those, those rail systems, which were, you asked about how, they, how, how things get built. A hundred years ago, those were all private. Yeah. And they were all built by private enterprise, largely to connect developable land with land that had been developed. So it was exp ever expanding our metropolitan area uh, that way through private enterprise. A developer would get a piece of, of property, a large piece of property, and build a railroad, a rail, a rail transit line out to that property. So it but then he had no incentive to maintain it once he had sold all the houses. So, so by the end of the Second World War, all of that system was in disrepair, and the private companies were throwing up their hands and saying, you take it, public, and the public did, and it shrunk down to, by the 60s, to zero. And then through the efforts of the, 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 the sales tax voted by the people of the county, um, we have built it back up to 70 miles. Measure R will double that, that mileage. Uh, Measure R will pay for operating all of that and improving the bus system. And we're gonna have a, a, a really highly successful and well used uh, well, th th I also heard in the question of the students uh, uh, about socioeconomic. I mean, let's be honest, this system is mostly, not mostly, but a vast majority of the riders are Latinos. Um, and um, you also see, and so it's incredible that we get the support to build this system, but you also see the incredible uh, subsidies that go to Metrolink, where there, there it's the majority of voter, uh, excuse me, the majority of riders there are uh, not Latinos because they're coming in from the suburbs. And every time we transport one person on a Metrolink, 
it costs us about what 20 times more than transport one person on a no every, every person who's on metrolink is not on the freeway so there's your freeing up freeway thing and i would suggest that we take another look at the inland empire and mm -hmm. the antelope valley those areas are not are those areas are majority minority just like other parts but there the is a racial system. divide in terms of ridership oh, in the population I'll let, ridership I'll let in Mr. one Katz, system versus I'll, the I'll other let mr katz talk about that but i'd like to i'd like to address what is a is another myth going around about the the uh, la county metro system that the buses are full of latinos mm -hmm. and the rail lines are full of white people that's what i just and, said and and it's not true oh, it's okay. not true <laughs> It's absolutely not true. Every time I okay. If if you if about half, statistically, half the people on the buses and half the people on the rail are Latinos. Hi there. My name is Priscilla Cotton. I'm a junior here at LMU. I'm a poli sci major, um, and my question kind of goes along with uh, the previous gentleman's question: is um, what kind of measures are being taken to increase the amount of people that are taking public transportation since you mentioned it's only about five percent well the, the biggest driver to public transportation is something out of our control but um, we've all been watching this year in particular because gas prices are now at you know 350 360 a gallon you know uh, for those of us that have been in this business for a while there's always been a debate about where that price point is that makes people jump you know for a while people thought it was 250 and then three and then 350 and we saw when gas reached 450 a couple years ago a significant jump in mass transit um, I'm now hearing from a lot of economists and folks that they expect gas to be approaching four bucks this summer and they don't see it coming down anytime soon as in years um, that will get more people on the system when we passed measure R we also froze the bus fare for seniors for disabled and for students to encourage more folks to get on the system both the MTA and Metrolink partner with businesses and have discount programs that we will work out with a business if the business instead of a parking space will give their employees Metro passes or Metrolink passes so we are spending a lot of time working with student associations also in both organizations because we, you know we view students as our future riders as well so if we can do discount fares and things now to get you used to taking the system you know you're going to use it in the future so we're putting a lot of effort into attracting new riders and any suggestions you've got on how we could do a better job I think we'd all like to hear it that's something very important to us and we're we're trying to do better and Paul I'd like to add one thing um, I think it's fair to say uh, of one fair criticism of Metro is that um, oftentimes and I find this when I use the bus uh, when I go out to use the bus when you go out to use the bus it doesn't come when you when you expected it to come um, or if it does come, maybe um, maybe it's dirty, maybe it's not as clean as it should be. Um, we're we're working on those things. We're 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 we've we've been disinvesting in things like management of the service and cleanliness of the system, and we're beginning right now to reinvest in that, so people will find it to be a pleasant experience and a reliable form of transportation. Then I would say I think that it's a legitimate criticism from some people that there has been a focus on rail because there has been because there's capital to build rail buses are you know buses need drivers and operators and people to clean them and maintain them and bonds don't pay for that but bonds play for rolling stock and trains and capital expenditures uh, so I think that in years past you know uh, before Paul and I were at the MTA there there was some legitimate criticism we have worked hard since Mayor Villaraigosa has been since Antonio got elected to be to be mayor five years ago you know to make sure that you know we're putting as much effort into making the buses appealable as we are doing the rail and what Paul was talking about you know it's the little things that make a difference why get on why, you know if you're if you're a discretionary rider if you're you know someone who doesn't have a choice you may make a different choice if it's just if it's dirty if it's uncomfortable if you don't feel safe it doesn't look like something you want to be riding those are all things that influence those decisions that so we're let trying me to fix. see by a show of hands how many of you have ridden a, a bus in the last two months a public bus no I'm, I'm come on I'm not talking about the party bus on Thursday night <laughs> the uh, <laughs> yeah. well, that's impressive I'm actually a lot a lot more than how I many thought. were riding the party bus on Thursday night <laughs> I thought that was cool. <laughs> thank you thanks next hello my name is Sean I'm from dr. Singleton's class I'm the econ major 
I'd like to address my question to Mr. Paul Taylor. Um, if the uh, NFL stadium was to build in, is to be built in downtown, how um, would you plan to solve the traffic problem that it, it, the stadium it might attract 60,000 people on a Sunday? How do you plan to solve that kind of a huge amount of traffic? Yeah, and, and have the NFL pe or the um, AEG people spoken to you about what? The, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. We're we're talking to them about how that would happen. We're also talking to the people in the city of industry who are talking about a stadium out there, um, and it's not an easy answer. Uh, the the my flip answer is that at least it's only eight or ten times a year uh, that 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 there be that there. But but the reality is we have a pretty good um, infrastructure. Uh, now and in the future with the expo line coming on to the west side and the subway being extended and the, and the regional connector linking up the light rail lines downtown and I think we'll have we have a lot of practice because we have um, a, a Lakers games Lakers celebrations let's watch for the all-star game coming yeah. up this month how that works um, and we're learning a lot about how to get people in and out of that area pretty Right. Yeah, I mean, you also have the other uh, pro football team in L.A., USC, at the Coliseum. They play on Saturdays. But right. that, that experience. And, and that, that's a very telling experience, too. We're learning but, a but lot. But what, what happens on Saturday's USC game? They have people parking in lots of peripheral locations downtown when the, where the parking isn't used on the weekends. And they, ta they take buses down to, to the Coliseum. And we're working with them on how between the expo line, which will start up, uh, next year and the current busing regime how we are we're gonna work with, uh, with but, the, you know for now we also do speak. special but I mean MTA and Metrolink also do spec we, we try and work out some special deals for instance Metro MTA last year started a special bus to Dodger Stadium if you take a train into Union Station you'll take a bus that will take that we have a bus that we're partnering with the Dodgers on and the air quality district that'll take you into Dodger Stadium so you can use mass well, transit the bus is, I think, a, a buck. I mean, our buck no, fares well, are. It's, it's, it's the regular fare, but if you have a Dodger ticket, it's free. It's free. Wow. Okay. Parking costs like, what, $15? $15 right. to park. Wow. Right. So, so last go, to, year, go to Union Station, get a ride for free, yeah. and buy an extra hot dog. And last, last season. Oh, no, season, wait. A hot dog and a beer cost more last than 15 season about Yeah, about good luck. <laughs> good luck. Last season, about 1,000 people a game did that. Oh, very and cool. That's, you know, that's, you know, yeah. two so or three percent of yeah. capacity, but it's still. But that's part of the answer is, you know, you have your regular thing, at least it's downtown, you know, this, this site yeah. where we have a lot of infrastructure. And then we try to work out other things as well, special trains, special buses. For instance, when the Angels, the All-Star game last year, Metrolink ran later trains than normal to accommodate people going back and forth from Anaheim. Because there's a Metrolink station right by the stadium, right? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Charlie Piowski. I'm a senior environmental science major. and. Uh, you guys have touched on this a few times, but I was kind of curious because water and transportation are such huge environmental frontiers. How does that play into your future planning or your planning now? Well, I think, I mean, I'll let Jeff deal with water and Paul talk more specifically, but, you know, we're at Metro, we're looking at how you electrify the system. And, you know, we're going to start talking with DWP and others about how we take the buses and, and the rest of our system and electrify it. And, you know, Metro recently, you may have seen an article about two weeks ago we retired the last diesel bus in the metro fleet we have 2,000 we have 2,000 CNG buses yeah. in our fleet in it's the largest in the country it's the largest and it's a hundred percent clean clean fuel burning we were the first in the country to do it also we were the guinea pig um, we had some rough years in the beginning with our CNG buses when they were a little hard to make but uh, we have always tried to take a longer term view so both MTA and Metrolink are looking at you know what we construct and how do we do it in a more appropriate and a green manner we're building a new um, um, op center for Metrolink and we're you know we're looking at lead certification for that business that building and how we get there so it's very you know we're looking at the at the materials that go into constructing our trains and our cars and our buses you know so how do we how are we part of the solution at MTA we've had a number of solar projects where we now have a number of our facility our, our maintenance facilities that have solar panels on the roof so we're trying to uh, be a leader in that field also Jeff uh, if you're if you're into environmental planning good career choice uh, particularly in California so that's always for all you guys about jobs that's a great career choice uh, because we love to environmentally plan in this state um, 
we are looking at this peripheral canal slash tunnel. It's looking at like a tunnel. The, the plan, we are in year three of the planning process and a five-year planning process. This is just to get an environmental permit to build it, not the actual design of the project. Just to get the environmental permit, we are going to spend $250 million in environmental planning. Now, wait a minute. $250 million not to build a single thing, but nope. just, just to, to get a document that will be about this big. That was a quarter of a billion dollars to get a document that someone can stamp on it and say, project, go ahead, now go spend the next billion to go design it. So environmental planning, you know, whether, whether you think it's being overdone or not, it's, it's a reality. It has to be done for every project and it has to be done exhaustively. And so it's a good career choice, if nothing else. Yeah, and the kind of another thing I saw in that question is what will, and this is very vague question, but what would MWD look like in 10 years? Would it be much different than what it looks like today? Uh, it, it, it'll be different, and no doubt about it. Um, we are, what is happening is um, you, you're going to see, for instance, we were a very heavy engineering organization 10, 20 years ago, much about, it was all about building, building, building. Now it's all about uh, we probably don't expect to build new projects to deliver new water. It's all about designing and, and, um, and, and how to conserve and how to do local projects. So you see lots of a, a shift from a heavy engineering agency to a much more a design integration agency. Uh, so different skill sets. You also, uh, the average age in our utility, which is true for most utilities, is 48, 49. So we're going to see a wave of retirements and a wave of jobs for young people that are going to have to come in with uh, new skills. Uh, for instance, half our stuff's out in the desert, but now we're, we used to have hundreds of people living in the desert to run all our pumping plants. We're now doing it with like four or five people at each pumping plant, and much of it's remote and computers. So uh, you know, our IT department went from 10 to over 100. That's how you're seeing the shift in the workforce, and that'll be how Metropolitan evolves. We are at uh, Loyola Marymount University, Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We have Mr. Jeff Keitlinger, General Manager of the Metropolitan Water District, Mr. Raul Amesqua from De La Rosa and Company, Mr. Paul Taylor from the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and Mr. Richard Kast Katz, Chairman Sorry. of Metrolink. So in, in terms of, a, let, let's start with Richard and, sure. and come this way in terms of final thoughts. Uh, try, you know. Um, Infrastructure, Los Angeles, water, energy, etc. Uh, if there was one key thought that you would want to leave young students about that, what what would that be? I guess the the key thought I would want you guys to take away from this is more generic in the sense of the importance of being involved. Uh, you know, you could say, as, as Fernando was kidding me earlier, I am a poster boy for every vote counts. Um, having been through that election but in the same way you know there's an old saying that you know you know, vote in the choice is yours don't vote in the choice is theirs same thing's true for all these projects you know ideas somebody had asked where some of the ideas come from how this happens it can come from an individual come from a class and come from somebody who just says hey can we do this um 3010 will happen uh it may not be exactly 10 years maybe a couple years long but it will happen we have the capacity and the will to do it we are spending more money we have a very aggressive bike program both at metro and the city of la Mayor's been pushing hard for a more expanded bike program, and those two things are happening. And in terms of advertising or promoting uh, the changes, I think both Metro MTA has won a number of awards for their advertising program about the rails. We're going to do more about letting people know how, how to use it, convenient it is. You can follow Metrolink on Twitter and, and find out where your train is and if it's on time or how late it's running. There's a, you know, we're trying to use at both, at both agencies social networking and the social media to do a better job of communicating. Paul? My boss said it. I'll say one thing. Can we do it? Si se puede. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Raul? I like that. Um, you know, the only thing I would say about infrastructure is that the needs are infinite. Um, they will never, never, never completely go away. After you finance uh, a new water treatment plant, it will probably last you 30, 40 years, and then you have to build it again, make it better, the technology changes. So when people ask me, are you bullish on the industry, I always say, you know, financing infrastructure will never go away. The need will always just continue to grow so long as population uh, continues to grow. So there's many, many fields that you could uh, pursue, and, uh, you know, it's exciting. Jeff? 
Sustainability is a big buzzword. You hear a lot of it. Uh, it's a very true thing that's very important for Southern California because we are a very crowded place and we're going to have to live more and more within our means. And the only other thing I'd add to it is responsibility. Uh, a lot of the stuff we have to do, we can't just keep saying, well, you know, I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to pay taxes. These are all things that we all have to do to make this place a better place to live. We all have to fund it and we all have to take care of it. Okay. Hey, let's give our panel so thank you. Thank you.